most of us by now are aware that on Friday the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that same-sex couples have a constitutional right to marry. Because the court ruled that it is a matter of constitutionality, that now prevents states from creating any laws that abridge or prevent people from exercising this right. Now what that does in effect is there were 14 states prior to Friday's ruling that had laws on their books that banned the issuing of marriage license uh, to homosexuals. What the ruling on Friday has done, it, is, it basically strikes down or it, it makes those laws illegal because, uh, because of the ruling it says that uh, they are now infringing upon the rights of these individuals uh, to be married. This morning I would like for us to take just a few minutes to think about our response to an historical ruling. And it is an historical ruling. It, uh, it certainly changes the landscape of, uh, of our country and how, we, uh, how our country uh, defines marriage. I'd like to look at it from a couple of perspectives this morning. First, I'd like for us to think about what are some things that this ruling does not change. And there are some things that it does not change. And I also want us to think about some things that the ruling does change. There are some things that will be different going forward after this ruling. We need to be aware of them. And lastly, I want us to think about what the ruling should reinforce for us as Christians. First, let's think about what the ruling doesn't change. First and foremost, I guess, you know, we, the short answer would be it doesn't change anything about the Bible. Nothing about this book changes because of the ruling that men made on Friday morning. But to be specific, I want us to note that the ruling by the Supreme Court does not change God's view of marriage. God created marriage. And he defined marriage. Brother Hewlin just read for us Genesis chapter 2, verses 22 through 24. And I'd like to reread again verse 24 because Jesus, this is the same verse that Jesus quotes in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 4 when he says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. We would be able to see that when God created Eve, when he created woman for man, there was a reason for that. There was no helpmeet suitable. That means made for, that was uh, correctly made for man. And so God made a help meet or appropriate for man. That helper just happened to be woman. And so God ordains marriage even going all the way back to Genesis chapter 2 when the man and the woman are in the Garden of Eden. God's view of marriage also has not changed in that marriage, as God has defined it, it is honorable in contrast to fornication and adultery. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4, the writer there says, Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. This word fornication it applies to all sexual sin. That would include those that are engaging in sex outside of marriage. Those that are, uh, as we might say, living together or cohabitating. Right? 
that would, that would encompass this idea of fornication. Those that practice homosexuality, that would also fall into this topic of fornication or sexual immorality. Um, all of those are, are encompassed in that, in that term. And here the writer contrasts that, the fact that God will judge that type of sin, he contrasts that with marriage, which he says, that's honorable. The bed is undefiled. But we should also know that God's view on marriage also has not changed in that it is an earthly bond. And it is not supposed to supersede or go beyond or be more important than our spiritual bond with Christ. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 37, Jesus said, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He's saying, look, there's no, there's no bond on this earth that should be more important to you than following me. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, Paul says, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul also writes in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 32, he writes about this this marriage union that exists between the church and Christ. Now, he addresses it in the first part to wives, saying that they should uh, submit to their husbands. But he goes on to make a point about Christ and the church. And so in verse 24 of Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says, Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ... So let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Now, we could make a whole other lesson about this uh, uh, relationship that exists between husbands and wives. I want us to focus on this relationship between Christ and his church. He says the church is subject to Christ. When we pair this along with what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 37, we should, it should be very obvious to us that if I'm going to be a Christian... My relationship with my wife, as important as that relationship is, it is not more important than my relationship with Christ. That is the most important relationship for me to maintain, for me to nurture. Well, Jake, why are you making that point? Because even if the United States or any nation says that two homosexuals are married according to their laws... If they want to become Christians, they have to put God ahead of their mate, whoever that person is. It doesn't matter. If a person is going to be a Christian, they have to put God and Christ ahead of any earthly bond that they may have. The ruling also does not change God's view of all sin. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, Paul writes that the wages of sin is death. That has not changed because of the ruling on Friday. The punishment for sin is the same as it always has been. When a person commits sin, when that person commits iniquity, they are separated from God. That's what we read about in the book of Isaiah. It says, your iniquities have separated you from God so that he cannot hear you. But not only does the punishment for sin not change, but we also realize that what constitutes sin does not change. If you would, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. What also has not changed is that those that practice sin Sin will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? 
Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. You may have noticed there in verse 9 that he uses the terms homosexuals nor sodomites. There are two different words there uh, that are rendered in the Greek. Um, one is catamites, and that's the one that's rendered as homosexuals. That would be, I guess you would say, the more effeminate uh, partner in a homosexual union. And then the sodomites, that would be the more masculine in, the, in, that, uh, in that pairing. But those are not the only sins that are listed in this grouping. Uh, Paul also has another uh, grouping in Romans chapter 1. His discourse really kind of begins in uh, verse 22, where he says, Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. He's talking about the root of all of these issues is that man has decided to substitute himself in place of God. And so when we think about how does God view sin, any kind of sin, that's what he sees it as. Any kind of sin is man putting himself on a pedestal above God. And so man is serving himself. He is serving his own desires rather than serving the will of God. And that causes Paul to say, and we could read down through verses 26 all the way down through 31 and read about all of these different types of sin. They all fall under the same umbrella of people putting themselves ahead of God. But notice in verse 32, Paul finishes it up by saying, Who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. What things? All of those sins that he just enumerated in the, in the preceding verses. He says these people, they know the righteous judgment of God and they know that these things are wrong and deserving of death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. God's view of sin has not changed one iota based on the ruling on Friday. The punishment for sin is still death. Those that practice sin still will not inherit the kingdom of God. And those who approve of sin will continue to share in the guilt of those who practice it. All three of those things are still true and have not changed. Now the ruling has created some changes. There are some things that going forward will be different for Christians here in the United States. And we should be aware of those. One of the first things that this ruling changes, and, and really it is a change that has been happening for many years, but maybe we would say that it is going to serve to accelerate this change, is the culture of sin in America. When I use the word culture, what does that mean? A culture is something that defines what types of behavior are acceptable and what types of behavior are unacceptable in a particular group. If you go to the, the place where I work, there is a culture there. That group has a culture that says it's not acceptable to be lazy in our factory. We are the kind of people that we come in and we work hard every day. There's a culture inside that group that says, you know what? Sometimes our customers ask for things that seem impossible. And the culture inside of our group is we get it done. We will service our customer. That's a culture that has built up over many years. 
in our society, the same thing is true. If we go back and we look at almost every civilization that's ever existed, we can look at the Greeks, we can look at the Romans, the European civilizations, and now we see even, it appears, America. All of these groups had a progression towards fewer and fewer moral boundaries. The progression was that we're going to stop saying that certain things are wrong. We may turn a blind eye to things that we said were wrong in the past. And there are certain things that we said were wrong in the past that we're going to embrace and say it's okay. That culture has been happening in America for many years. It's not just recent. But decisions like the one on Friday, they only serve to accelerate the change in that culture. It is important for us to realize that because the more that sin and false teaching are accepted by society, the more difficult it is for people to escape the consequences of sin. And I'm going to give you a really good example. Divorce and remarriage. There was a time when the only reason you could get a divorce was for the scriptural reason of adultery, unfaithfulness on the part of a spouse. Do you realize that today you can't even get a divorce for adultery? It's only labeled as irreconcilable differences by the court. But that's not what causes it to be a problem. The problem is that the false teaching on divorce and remarriage and the, we'll call it legalization, of divorcing for basically any reason has caused lots and lots of divorces and it's caused lots and lots or it's led to lots and lots of marriages between people who are not eligible to be remarried. And now when you bring them the gospel and we talk about sin in their life, how do you respond when someone says, wait a minute? You mean I have to leave my wife? I can't, I can't be with my husband because of what the Bible says? You see what a sticky situation that becomes? This same type of situation will occur because of the ruling that was made on Friday. There will be those that will enter into in our in our nation homosexual marriages and when the time comes when they are faced hopefully they are faced with the gospel and they're faced with the word of god and they're getting close to saying you know what i, I actually i do believe the bible i think i do need to do what the bible says and then they're going to get to this point where it says oh you mean i can't you mean i i can't be in this this relationship with this person those earthly bonds are very strong. Regardless of how they're formed, they are very strong. It makes it very difficult for us to bring the gospel to people. We need to be aware of that change. This ruling also changes the legal atmosphere in our country for Christians. We have Christians who own businesses. They provide a service or a product to the public at large. How will they respond when they are asked to provide services specifically for uh, a homosexual marriage? What will happen if they deny those services? What are the legal ramifications for that Christian, what are the spiritual ramifications for the Christian? What about ministers? We have many ministers today that perform weddings, that have public speaking engagements. If they are vocal in the Bible's stance on sin in any form, then they would have to include in their comments... The fact that God views homosexuality as an abomination to God. 
how will that view, how will that, uh, how will that change their legal standing? Will they be allowed to continue to perform weddings? Will they be forced to perform weddings for uh, both heterosexual and homosexual couples? Will they be faced with the possibility of fines or imprisonment for refusing to do, to do those things? And even congregations will be faced with legal consequences from this ruling. What can a building be used for? If we allow the building to be used by people outside of the members of the congregation, if we allow it to be used by the public for engagements like uh, things like a trick-or-treat, or if we allow the building to be used for uh, weddings of, of heterosexual couples, will we be forced to allow the building to be used for homosexuals as well? If we refuse to offer services to homosexual couples, or if we refuse to allow fellowship with homosexual couples, will we lose our tax-exempt status in the, in the eyes of the United States? Those are all questions that will most likely have to be answered at some point because of the ruling that was made on Friday. But there is one thing that will change that I think actually could be a positive. And that is the opportunity that we have to live out our faith. You see, because of the ruling on Friday, it's going to increase the opportunities that we have to study the Bible with others. Because this, uh, this topic is so current, because it is so top of mind for people, it now gives us an opportunity in conversations with others to invite them to study the Bible with us. They may not even agree with that decision, but we would still look in and we would say, you know what? I noticed that you disagreed with the decision. I, I saw what you posted on Facebook or, or I overheard your comments. Um, you know, we're, we're always studying the Bible and this is something that we're very concerned about as well. Could we study the Bible together? We just created an opportunity to study with someone and hopefully to share with them eventually the gospel of Christ. It also gives us an opportunity to live out our faith because it gives us an opportunity to share the gospel and highlight what Peter and John said in Acts chapter 5 and verse 29 when they were in front of the council and they said, we ought to obey God rather than men. They said, yeah, yeah, you've got your rules. We understand that. But we're still going to be living by God's rules. We'll still continue to respect the authority of God. We're going to continue to live our lives the way that God wants us to live our lives. We're going to continue to teach the things that God says we're supposed to teach. Remember, that's why Peter and John got in trouble in the first place. They were preaching the resurrection of Jesus. And they were teaching salvation in the name of Jesus. And that may lead to persecution. And if we are persecuted, we should be able to rejoice as Peter and John did in Acts chapter 5 and verse 41. You'll notice that they said that they, were, they went out and they rejoiced. Because they had been counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. I'm not saying that we should be glad about the decision that was made on Friday. Don't get me wrong. When godless people are in charge of making the rules. When godless people are in charge of enforcing the rules. And when godless people are in charge of interpreting the the rules, why should we expect anything different than the decision that was rendered on Friday? We are called out to be a special and peculiar people, not just as a nation, 
We are called out to be special and peculiar even among our own people, even among our own nation. There should be something that sets us apart. Something that people look at and they say, man, there is something different about these people. Sometimes they're going to want to know what it is that makes us different. And we're going to get to share with them the opportunity that we have for salvation in Christ. Sometimes they're going to look at us as being different and they're going to persecute us because of it. Regardless of whichever one of those things happens, we still have an allegiance to God and a responsibility to do our duty as Christians. And so that brings me to my last point this morning. That the ruling that was made on Friday, it should help to reinforce certain things. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 through verse 17, Peter writes, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good, than for doing evil. This ruling should reinforce in our minds the need to sanctify God in our hearts. You know what sanctify means? It means to take something out and, and give it a special place. To say there's something unique about this thing, something that is worthy of honor. It's worthy of me putting it up on a pedestal. And so we're supposed to sanctify God in our hearts. He is supposed to have a special place in our life. When I think about how I live my life every day, when I get up in the morning, is there a special place for God every morning? What about when I have meals? Is there a special place for God when I have meals with my family or by myself? What about when I travel? When I go on vacation? Is there a special place for God when I go on those when I do those things? What about when I'm at work? What about when I'm having conversations with other people? Is there a special place for God in my heart so that whenever I open my mouth, I'm always speaking about the things of God? It should also reinforce for us the need to prepare to defend our faith. Notice he says, be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Have you put in the practice time? You know, in, in sports, there's this uh, phrase that you practice like you play. And conversely, you will play the way that you have practiced. If football players spend hours and hours on the practice field running their drills over and over again until they know them to perfection, when they get out on the playing field, they don't have to think about what to do. Their body responds naturally, almost instinctively. Their body just knows what to do. I've got to be studying this book I've got to be preparing my mind so that when I do run into the situation, and it will happen, when I finally get that situation where someone asks me, so you think homosexuality is wrong? Oh, so uh, you think a person needs to be baptized in order to be saved? Oh, you're the ones that think you're the only ones going to heaven, don't you? It's too late to practice when you get in the situation. you got to put in the practice beforehand. Prepare our hearts. Prepare to defend our faith. And finally, that ruling should reinforce the need for good conduct in my life. Notice in verse 16. He says, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, when they say bad stuff about you, 
the very ones who are saying all that bad stuff about you, they're going to be ashamed because you've lived a life that is so just, so holy, so pure, and so righteous that when people start digging into the facts, they say, this is just a good guy. She's just such a good woman. I, I don't, there is no merit to this person's slander of this person. I don't see how they could form this opinion of this person because this person lives their life in such a way that they are a city on a hill. They let their light so shine among men that people will see their good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. And so the question that I have, when I, and this gets back to how do we respond to the ruling that was made on Friday do my words and my actions, do they serve to widen the gap between myself and the lost? Or do my words and actions help make that gap a little smaller? There are some people that, are, that have already taken to Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and they've written on the internet, on their blogs, and they've sent letters to congressmen, and they've gotten on television and radio, and all you hear coming out of their mouth is hateful stuff. <coughs> that doesn't help close the gap between us and the lost. It just pushes them further away. As Christians, we need to be looking for ways to close the gap by our good conduct, by our actions, and by our words. Yes, there are some things that the ruling on Friday has changed. The political and the religious landscape of the United States will not be the same on Monday morning as it was Friday morning. But there's a lot of things that haven't changed. And it's the important things that haven't changed. The things that God says are important and the things that God says that we need to be doing as Christians. This morning, if you have a need to respond to the invitation of the Lord, maybe there are some things that you need to change in your life. Maybe it's an attitude that you have or maybe it's uh, a certain uh, habit or an action that you've been struggling with. This morning I would encourage you to commit to sanctifying God in your heart. Give him, this, give him a special place. Commit yourself over to him. And you're going to begin to prepare your defense for your faith. And you're going to start living a life with such good conduct that even when people say bad things about you, no one would believe it. If you're subject to the invitation, I'd ask you to come now while we stand and sing.